Thanks, Sandeep, for uh, accepting the invite here. And, uh, but I don't want to take anything, but I would like you to start your journey. Um, firstly, thank you. This is the only way I could get into the IIM Bangalore. You know, I figured yeah. I'll take the invitation. <laughs> Mum was so proud. She had tears in her eyes. You know? <laughs> but um, thank you. It's lovely to be here with all of you and um, to finally... Um, you know, the thing is, uh, when Rachita called me two weeks back and said, uh, would, we're doing this as a part of the Selco Foundation, talking about impact and failure, and I started, uh, and she asked me to come and speak about this, and I realized, man, I've got a lot of failures to talk about. <laughs> so how do I make it not all about myself, but also try to resonate with what all of you are trying to make sense of with what you do? Um, so for me, I think the biggest learning is I've been in the space of stand-up for the past 13 years and it, it's, a, it's a very individual space if you want it to be but at the same time you can make it a very noisy space if you choose to go down that path and both, both those are points of failure which I realized right? one is an internal value system one is an external value system and if you want to also just take in the aspect of the fact that I'm visually impaired and had had this eye condition for the past 30 odd years now, um, you're automatically seen as a failure by society, which is a great thing because the standard's really low, so you don't have to do much to succeed. <laughs> so, yeah, I think the internal value system of failure is such an important thing because it's something that you can perceive through your reality and perceive through your sense of what makes, uh, what matters to you. Uh, but the external value system is what we're all conditioned to sort of believe in, right? The success aspect is so damn gorgeous, as Nitin was saying. It's the Porsches, it's the, the fancy house, it's, it's the, the Louis Vuitton bags, and it's the pat on the back, or it's the bonus, or it's the boys' club, or the girls' club. Uh, failure is always like this plummeting feeling in your sphincter, this sense of rejection, this blame, shame, guilt, and fear, and it's not an attractive place to be, right? So it's, it's a very difficult space in the external value system because we all want our kids or our parents want us, us or we want our friends to to do well but then it also becomes this cluster of ones where someone else's success is your failure as opposed to just staying in that space but if you shift i feel in the internal system it isn't as black and white right it can be a learning for you to look at what you've done or rather sometimes what you've not done well as a way to kind of proceed uh, in, a, in a direction which you would have not gone down if you had succeeded, if that makes sense. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I am. And um, after a few more beers, maybe I'll have some more thoughts. So <laughs> where did you get the beer? From? I haven't got it yet. No, so, <laughs> yeah, because in I am, I'm not sure about that. That's so what the B stands for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need to change that, right? <laughs> so now, now you said that you have failed so much. Where have you succeeded? Yeah, I, mm, being here, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, it's such a beautiful thing. If you want to make it sound romantic, you can say failure is the most amazing thing. But no, failure hurts. It, it makes you think and makes you spend a lot more time with yourself without the distractions that success brings. And that time you spend with yourself is scary. Uh, it makes you look within. It makes you ask questions about your... Um, way of looking at things and most importantly of why you're doing what you're doing. I'll give you an example. In stand-up, what's the simplest thing to do? Not the simplest, but what's the most basic thing? Make people laugh. But my God, the number of people I've heard, comedians, bringing in excuses for why they couldn't do it. Like, oh, they don't speak my language. Oh, they don't get my frame of contact. Oh, I love And that's the noise. That's the external systems, right? Man, I, he got Netflix, I got Amazon Prime, he got YouTube, I got five views, he got Spotify, I got, you know, All India Radio, I mean, God forbid. Uh, whatever the thing is, but <laughs> that's what I mean by the external. The, the external is so much of not making people laugh, being the focus, because if that's your job, then you just find a way to make any room of people you're presenting in front of laugh. But no, it's 30, and, and Strangely, you know, 2019, I was stuck in that space because I'm sure all of you can kind of understand this place of you are constantly waiting for external validation from your peers or from society at large or for those big ticket wins, then you're at the mercy of being pulled in different directions. And there are a lot of people to do that. In fact, 
there's a career which people take up in manipulation, right? Where when you do badly, they're at your shoulder. They're like, that's okay, you're a really funny guy, just that the audience doesn't get you. But you know what? It's fine. When you do well, they're like, yeah, but you're not as funny as ex comedian. You know, I can drop names, but why? Um, and it becomes that you are never centered, you're never balanced, you're constantly better than someone, worse off than someone, someone better than you means you're not as good. So that's where I mean the failure is most uh, visual, it's most sort of um, crushing in that sense, right? That's when they show people in movies, like the comedian almost, you know, he almost takes sleeping pills and a bottle of scotch, and next thing he wakes up going, no, I'm gonna write a new joke, and next thing he's riding off into the sunset or the comedic sunset with a, you know, an Oscar or a BAFTA, whichever award, but that's not even what matters because the, 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 the internal conversation is something that gets you going, right? It's like, I'm here to make people laugh, and it doesn't mean if I sell 1,000 tickets or 10 tickets, it's each process is something that I enjoy, and I don't want to say the byproduct is fame or success, but it could or couldn't happen. But if you enjoy that little small win, it just makes that moment more successful. I feel, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, Sandeep, see, the question is: in the last, as as we were speaking before, you have you have you have diversified into looking at these podcasts right now, right? In a sense, why? Um, I love talking and not many people were coming for my shows, so <laughs> I figured I'd just do it on the internet. Um, I think the, the lockdown gave me a sense of what I really enjoy doing. So I did a series during the lockdown called Life Gone Wrong, basically a podcast covering how people who've experienced adversity in some shape or form have taken stock of what they have and done something with it. And that led me to look at myself because the two biggest things is one is it ties into failure because we're kind of you know if i was looking for the longest time at life or things around me from a very different lens i was looking at um maybe looking attributing my disability or eye condition saying i can't do some things i, I i'm, I'm unable to, therefore, I will always be envious of someone who can go jogging or driving or someone who can read a book or someone who can make eye contact with an attractive girl or guy. Or the, you're always coming from this place of I can't, so it's never going to be a place of I can. So I shifted that saying, okay, you know, there, there, are, there are things I can't do. I, 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 can, I can't drive, which um, probably a good thing. Um, <laughs> I, I can't go jogging because you know what? It, it's tiring. And so you start looking at the things you can do, which is, you know, I like talking, I, I like understanding, I, li I like being curious, I like meeting new people, I, I like making people laugh, I like spending time with close friends. So when you work from that premise, you're not always feeling rejected. And that's something I enjoyed. So then I started uh, talking to people on the, the, the podcast, started getting this nice sort of energy from them, and then being locked up, uh, the platforms which were you know, allowing you to put up stuff became less studio oriented about quality of sound. So you could do it from your Zoom or from your computer, uh, Zoom recording. And then I realized, wait, I can sit here instead of flying them down, putting them up in a hotel, getting a studio, getting all these props. I can reach out to anyone around the world and I can talk to them about anything and everything. And that's pretty much the description of my podcast. It's the Soapy Rao Show, fun conversation with people about anything and everything. And Sometimes I've, I've written to a neuroscientist, to a mathematician, and they're like a comedian who wants to interview. They're like, you want to roast us? I'm like, no, trust me, what? I don't have equation jokes, you know? So <laughs> it just makes every day when I have a recording that much more uh, interesting because it's sort of self-reflecting as well. And just to add to that, the second point besides the looking at life from a point of what you do have versus what you don't have, the biggest thing that helped me is this process of unlearning, where unlearning the way you are, the way you think, the way you look at things you do, look at the friendships, the relationships, why you have them, and that question starts coming up. Why am I doing this? Why am I a stand-up comedian? Is it for the fame or is it for the laughs? Or is it for satisfaction? Is it for the money? Or why am I playing a certain, wh wh why am I not playing or going back to, because when I was young I used to play golf and since my eyesight progressed, uh, it's worse now, I was like scared of not hitting the ball, but 
since I changed from the outcome of being a really good golfer to winning a tournament, now the question is why am I playing? Because I enjoy going out. And as of two weeks back, uh, we've introduced the concept of blind golf to India, and that's something that people are uh, catching on to, which is good for them, you know? Thank you. Yeah. What is, I mean, before I, I, I ask questions from the audience mm -hmm. uh, for that, uh, which is what, uh, what's been your biggest failure? I think not respecting myself. Yeah. Because it's a sense of self-loathing which kind of helps you latch on to these external value systems, right? Like, oh, you need to fit in, you need to be, you need to be the cool guy, the funny guy. But if you get a sense of balance and you set, sort of start asking every question from yourself to outward versus outward to within, I think you will realize that you have quite a lot of wisdom and you have a lot of integrity, maybe not integrity all the time, but you have a lot of things that you can answer yourself, which you waste a lot of time going around the world asking and then eventually you come back to yourself going, wait, it was right here all the time. What was the best, uh, what would be the best support system for if you look at, uh, for a comedian who's failing? I mean, I'm, I, I'm not saying you're failing, but uh, the question is, for a person who's thinking self-loathing, what is the best support system that a comedian would have to bank on, to move forward? I think to take a step back from other comedians, first of all, because <laughs> <laughs> we're, a, we're a toxic bunch of people. The moment we send blood, we're like, he's not funny, let's just, <laughs> let's cancel him. No, it's, uh, I think, I think, you need to have some reality outside because here another thing we do, right, with whatever job it may be, the moment we start taking it too seriously, that's the failing of that job because we're like, oh, you know, as comedians, we, when we sit down, society needs us, we hold a mirror to it. No, no one needs you, dude. Like, trust me, if you're, if you're not there, they, people will laugh. People will laugh at... Are you talking also of the graduates of this institute? Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sure, <laughs> I, I haven't... No, I think anyone, if, if anything is not indispensable, right? Like if anything is done with so much thing, like I've heard comedians going uh, with all these things, but why is it that then you have one comedian going viral and then the next nine funny things on YouTube is like a cat taking a piss on things. Like people can laugh and will find something to laugh at. So you don't need, and I have some comedians who said in the past, like, oh, I like doing, you know, dark jokes. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> and the jokes are not even dark and they're not even a joke. So the thing is that, you got to understand what you, it's, you know, in the moment sometimes you get typecast, right? Oh, you're doing dad jokes, or you're doing, you're doing uh, slapstick humor. I'm like, why are we putting all these things with anyone? Why are we putting so many boxes and confining an individual to that form of representation? Because they might be able to do multiple boxes, right? And I don't mean, of course, skill-wise, I'm just saying expression-wise. And if you take what you do with a little lighter heart and not so much pressure in yourself to succeed or whatever your idea and the external ideas of success are, those small steps of approaching that become more fun and I think the outcome, if you want to focus on that, ends up being more um, fulfilling, if not successful. Thanks, thanks Sandeep. Questions, please, for Sandeep. Anybody? That good, huh? Yeah, either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that bad. <laughs> what has he said over the past 10 minutes? Why didn't he tell any joke yet? So that, my guess, that's... Uh. No, yeah. Sandeep, see, the question is, uh, 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 where do you see, I mean, in a sense, there are, there are people in the audience who come from uh, different countries, mm -hmm. from, right, from Europe to, to countries in Africa, per se, and most of them, come from the sp sphere of climate and development per se, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they've all come to come to this conference for, um, basically uh, in a country like ours are in the world, in the development sector, uh, we have no failures. Yeah. The only sector which has no failure where no development has happened. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and, and so, so we, uh, if you think you self-loathe yourself, we privately self-loathe, <laughs> right? And that is why we have this conference for, so how do we bring out people? And what, what would you say? I mean, are, are you also getting into climate jokes? Not. <laughs> as long as Greta Thunberg has an Instagram account, never. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I get smashed back into a carbon morsel. <laughs> um, you know, the, 
interesting thing is, um, I'm not an expert in any field, right? I just like listening to human beings and sometimes talking over them. But um, what I find is the, 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 the metrics which people fixate on and the, the, the things that people use to gauge performance. Because um, I recently interviewed this lady and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give her the credit because she's made a lot of sense when she said that she's a Swedish lady who is, uh, focuses on focus. She's, that, that's what she talks about. And, and she said a lot of the things that might be um, repeated themes in our society is peak performance, right? Uh, be a better version of yourself. Be, um, look forward to enhancing your skills or becoming this particular thing. But that in itself, it takes away from doing what is required because it's the moment the, the, the outcome is the focus and not the process of doing. Um, so what she says is basically focus is um, living a life, and I'm paraphrasing, living a life where you've taken out most of the relevant things. So I've been looking at some of the things I've done through that filter and we waste so much time worrying about how we, have see, how we are seen and I'm not saying you know, even at work, I'm just saying how, how we want to impress people because they might uh, speak badly of us or might not accept them, accept us into their group or we worry about how we're going to look at the 10th reunion of our school or which university we didn't go to or go to as opposed to why are we even going there? Are we going to go for that party or the reunion and have fun or would still worry be like, gosh why am I here? And Many of us have that feeling, whether it's at university or job, we're like, why are we here? <laughs> but we spend so much time getting there, so does that make any sense? Right. So, so Sandeep, I, I mean, I can ask this question to Sandeep because I've heard him, uh, heard him before, and please don't judge that it's politically incorrect. And uh, from the same town, almost. Yeah. Almost, our ancestors. Yeah, <laughs> that's so. We have the same bad genes, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, but terrible, yeah. Uh, the, see, uh, what are the advantages of, of being partially blind? Um, you I have think you have, you have commented on that before, so. Well. <laughs> but which people will not realize because, oh, he's blind, etc. Et right, so being, you got, yeah, you, you know, have multiple advantages. I have a joke about this, and right. I'm gonna tell the joke first because just to, you know, give you guys a little respite from failure, 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 failure. Um, the thing in India, when you say you're partially blind, firstly, people think you failed at being blind. <laughs> 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 I mean, it almost is like they're disappointed with your lack of commitment. They're like, can't you work harder? Be fully blind. <laughs> like I've come fourth rank in the class of blindness, you know. It's, right. So yeah, it's, it's <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, it's, I remember this vividly when I was doing a talk in, and this talk was different. It was smaller, it was at a bar in the afternoon and this guy comes, he's like, Sandeep, I've seen you at a show and I really loved your talk about your journey as a visually impaired person, as a partially blind comedian. Will you be speaking about the same thing today? He thought that I go for different talks, making up different disabilities. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I, this is the only thing I have, <laughs> I don't. So, there are some stereotypes. Uh, what I've realized is, you know, sometimes being, I have, friends and acquaintances who are completely blind. And in some sense, it's harder, but in some sense, you don't really have anything to see, right? So you belong to a certain group and you're treated as a person who belongs to that group. If you're fully sighted, you belong to a certain group. This past, these partially blind guys annoy everyone. They can see a little bit and they can't see a little bit. So the blind guys get a little jealous. The people who are sighted, and we have to help them. So I've noticed it's, it's, not a, it's not a problem, but it's, you have to find where you belong. And that was something that told me in different directions, right? You want to impress. I mean, it's weird even in dating. Um, who do you go for, right? <laughs> Like, you go on a blind date, no pun intended. Like, if you go with, <laughs> you go with someone who's blind as well, you're sitting at two different tables, you never end up meeting your date, right? <laughs> you go with someone sighted, you're so terrified that they'll find out, and that way you have to go half an hour before, you have to set up everything in the right place, and someone comes, who's gonna pay the bill? You're like, oh crap, what's the amount, right? So there's so many fears. But it also can, as I said, if, if, if you've changed the focus from partially blind to partially sighted, Changes it a bit. Yeah, I mean, that sounded a bit cheesy. I'm sorry. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. No, now I'm fourth rank incited people. <laughs> uh, no, 
because some years ago said the good part is that being a comedian, partially blind comedian, that you had no competition. Is that true? Absolutely. But now there are two others. Yeah. Oh, is it? Uh, and they're more blind than me. Oh. And they're women, so I've lost the market. Like, that's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woke culture has thrown me out. <laughs> no, but I, I did say that it was actually something which um, got me into trouble. Because I, I said I'm India's only, being the, the advantage of being India's only blind comedian is that I can't see my competition, right? And some person commented on this social media post saying, how dare you say you're India's only blind comedian, you're visually impaired, there's another girl who's actually blind, you better take this post down. Nah, 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 nah. And I was angry, right? I was a man, a 39-year-old man who was angry, so I went to that comment and I said, sorry. Because <laughs> you don't mess with social justice warriors, you know? So, how do yeah. you get trolled? I don't. That's, that's when I'm glad I'm blind. <laughs> I can't see those comments. But I, I, I've gotten, you know, people on YouTube, um, I don't know what, what the YouTube rationale is. I put up a, comment, a video a long time back about Kanadigas and having some jokes about North Indians. And everyone just took off on me. And the most, and it wasn't about my eyes saying, you blind guy, how dare you? It was like, you're gay. That was all of it. Like, I was like, wow, what is this? Is there like an algorithm just taking these comments and putting it on me? Is there a sign I should be listening to tell my wife? Like, you know, I think there's, a, there's something they're on to. But yeah, it, it was strange. I, I, I don't really spend too much time on social media because it kind of messes with my head. Thanks, thanks. Question? Yeah, Arish, I have a question for Sandeep. Sure. Yeah. Uh, hi, Sandeep. Um, no clue where you are, but hello. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so my question to you is why is there so little political comedy in the country? Uh, that is why our comedians not speaking up truth to power, is failure written all over that because of the heavy hand of the state? Um, yeah, do you guys discuss this in your circles? Is someone willing well, to Well, I don't think people in politics in our country have a sense of humor, so when that's... <laughs> be it whatever state of politics, whether it's the state level, the city level, and you need your audience to have a sense of humor, otherwise you might as well just go slap them, right? I mean, because anything you say is going to offend them. Um, and I think more than making jokes about someone, I think learning to laugh at yourself is a good thing to do, because um, otherwise it's very easy to use this external thing that, oh, he's attacking me, so he, they'll get the entire troll army or the other armies who are predominant in our country to go after someone, because it's, it takes a little bit of maturity to get humor. I'm not saying intellect, I'm saying a little bit of um, sense that, you know what, I can be wrong. I did probably mess up that entire, you know, country's GDP. It's okay, I can take a joke, hey. What, I mean, I've ruined a million lives, what's a joke? But no, it's, it's more like, wow, what it is, that? how dare you, I'll beat him up. I mean, how childish is that, right? Like, you probably see that in the kindergarten Sandpit, right? Like what you call my, you call me fat. I'm gonna <laughs> throw sand on you. That's our politics. That's pretty much. That's where our politicians are. And I, I so Kunal Kamra is a friend of mine, and he he's come home and stayed, and uh, we haven't met in a while. But what? So I don't comment on his comedy or what his strategy or whatever his direction is. But he, he's a funny guy, right? But uh, what's happened now is that he's driven into this particular hat on this role he's playing by his fans and I suppose that's good because he sells out shows across the world. So people clearly want to hear it, the audience. And um, the thing is, in comedy sometimes, political comedy gets, because it's so sort of sensitive and it goes to the level of you being threatened with your life or your family or your family's lives or your shows being cancelled or you being pelted with stones or some other comedian being banned from a city. I mean, did, are we, what are we talking about? Comedians? Are we talking about like spies for the state, right? It just sounds like it's such drastic measures. But good comedy takes discussion, it takes back and forth and none of that's happening. So we can't have good political comedy until we have more, um, more of it. So to have one good comedian about dark jokes, or if you want to call it like, you know, risque jokes, you need to have 100 of them doing it. But if you have one person doing, I mean, doing jokes on political comedy, obviously it's going to be mediocre, or it's going to be very um, sort of skewed in a certain, in a, towards a certain direction. So we need many more people to do it. We need hundreds of people, hundreds of, hundreds of shows on TV in different languages, in whichever platform, and as a result, you will start getting quality political humor, I, I think, yeah. I thought you were also talking of the development sector because we also are the same. So anyway. <laughs> yes, yeah. Manoj. TV, 
TV channels biggest? Are your biggest competitor? No. I mean, there's a lot of money there. But TV comedy is very different, right? Because gotcha. you'll have someone standing there saying, laugh, and everyone goes, ha, ha, ha. So mm, I, I, I had that in a show once. I did a show um, for, I think, MSNBC. It was one of their things where Salman Khan was a judge. So you can, you can imagine the caliber of that show. Um, <laughs> <it was laughs> I mean, I did a joke saying, you know, it was great growing up in India as a person who couldn't see because even I could drive, and that's like someone else we know. And he didn't get the joke. I was like, wow. <laughs> Um, I know, he, fortunately that evening, <laughs> no, no, fortunately that evening he had his driver with him, so I did my research. But TV comedy is nothing wrong with it, there's a market for it, and of course Kapil Sharma and Sunil Pal and the likes of that uh, circus they call, what's it called, the comedy circus, it's huge. Um, there, is, there is a market for that and I wouldn't take that away from people who love it, but um, it's not a competitor, I think now with Netflix and Amazon, um, that was what I was telling Harish as well, right? I was so obsessed with that at one point in 2019 that I wasn't enjoying my shows. I was, in, I was worried about... And when I recorded my special at the beginning of 2020, I wrote to Netflix, I wrote to Amazon, and none of them were responding with what I wanted to hear. They're like, yeah, we like your jokes, but we're not taking your special because you have only 1,500 followers on Instagram. I'm like, wow. That's what they're looking at. They're not looking at only funny. They're looking at how many people you can draw to their platform. So. When you detach yourself from your profession or from your art form or your work and say, you know what, I am still going to be this person. It might hurt a little bit, but I'll get over, to, get over it tomorrow. And you distance it. But if you're attached, that if, I'm a, if I fail at comedy, I'm a failure as a human being, that's very difficult to get out of. So um, to answer your question, which I clearly haven't yet, um, I think there is a space for everyone. And I think when you focus and of, on what you do from a place of why you do, you will find that place. I think so, yeah. All of this is just, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Last question. Uh, hi. Hello. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, I actually want to go back to something that uh, Harish, you just com commented on. It seemed like you're talking about the social sector when you said that you can't take a joke. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to stick my neck out and say I, I, I think that's true. Mm. Uh, we can't laugh at ourselves. We take ourselves a little too seriously. Mm. Uh, and maybe that's also a reason why there are no failures in the sector. Uh, so I'm curious to know from you, uh, what are things that you could, you think that we could do as a sector or even as individuals mm. to not take ourselves so seriously? Right, the work that we do is important, mm -hmm. not taking away from that, but it's a role that we play. And how do we, how do we remember that? And how do we sort of have those conversations more often? And how do we laugh more in the sector? Oof. Is there an opening as a consultant role anyway? <laughs> no, I think obviously the, th the work all of you do has a lot more at stake because other lives are impacted by it. If I do a bad joke, I, I, it's just me who's going to be a little, nah, they don't like me. So I think um, the biggest help for me, I think a lot of people say learn from your mistakes, right? I've realized to unlearn, every time you do something which has not gone your way, like for instance, last week I told you about the Blind Golf Initiative, I went with these expectations, right? And let's compare those expectations of hitting a 300 yard drive and being celebrated, carried on people's shoulders. Oh my God, this guy is the next Blind Tiger Woods or the Blind Woods or the Blind Tiger, whatever you want to call him. And <laughs> I had all these things in, on the way to the course and I went there, the first ball, I think I gouged out enough mud to make a lake for, for that area. And it, I was shattered, right? Like the entire day I just had stress on my shoulders and that's obviously the, the sense of failure. And if you want to compare that to a project, I think we're, we're more carried away sometimes, and I'm not taking away from any of the work any of you do. Sometimes the narrative is so fixed by our conditioning that we have to win, we have to, we have, to have these award ceremonies where we suddenly, every time we look at a project, we're like, we're like we have this medal being, you know, uh, you know, put around our neck and we're like being, you know, everyone's like, oh wow, a bottle of champagne, great. Why don't you do it when you fail? Because that doesn't matter. Like, give yourself a good dinner when you don't do well because, I mean, you're still the same person, right? And you might feel better because when you don't do well, you're in fact going to look at that problem saying, how can I approach it differently? Unlearn the way you've done that and say, you know what? It's okay. It's not easy. I'm not saying any of this is easy, but um, it's more healthy. 
<laughs> Let's put it that way. Your blood panels look better this year if you think in that way. Because otherwise it's constantly just building up this sense, this tightness in your body that I have to do it, someone else will do it better, someone else will get to that joke quicker, someone else will be funnier, someone else will be popular. Otherwise, if everyone just comes from this premise saying, yeah, it's okay, you know what, I'm going to uh, unlearn, I'm going to kind of look at why I'm doing this. And we all come from that place. I think life isn't that serious to be looked at so seriously, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. Last Thank couple of oh. advice to the audience. Oh, my God. Um, um, yeah. I had a question. Sure. Uh, Is I'm that God? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Oh, okay. Hi, Sandeep. Hello. So, um, I'm going to go back to what you talked about, uh, self-loathing. Mm. And since we are talking about failure here, uh, failure does induce a lot of self-loathing and, you know, uh, low self-esteem. So, as a person with disability, which often becomes a focus point, mm. uh, people sort of invisibilize the mental health aspect because they are constantly focusing on, oh, you have visual or auditory impairment or whatever is for for any person. So how do you think uh, the mental health aspect gets lost with people with disability? And do you think that needs to be also taken into account? I think all of us have mental health issues, you know, um, in some shape or form. And I think now again, there are broad brush strokes being applied, like saying you are anxious or you are depressed, but there are so many sort of nuances within that. And I think we need to respect that because it, the moment we say someone has a mental health issue, of course, they have to address it, get professional help. But if someone questions that and says, how is it, we demonize that person saying, You're, you don't understand. So th all this comes from a place of not kind of finding a mutual conversation. And I think it is, of course, harder, especially with if you add a disability, you add socioeconomic disadvantages. It is hard and you do need some of those successes, money, you need security to help you get out of that trap. But all the things I've said today is not, it's not going to take you from zero to 100, but it basically gave me a sense of starting with myself, whether it's asking the, and I think Nikhil mentioned this, right? It, it's something what's sort of helped me is stop asking for answers and start asking the right questions. And that helps you face whatever you have to with a little bit more balance from your place. Of course, you have absolutely no control with anything around you, whether it's even your family. Like you wake up in the morning, you don't know what your mom's going to tell you, or your dad or your partner, right? And you want it to be positive, but if you are coming from a place where you're already anticipating that, oh, they're going to say, you know, you're so lazy, you woke up late, you're going to, you're, you're, you're going to start the entire conversation from outside. It's never going to be silent inside. You're constantly working on your distractions. There's no time to look at yourself. So I think just of course, not taking away from professional help or any kind of thing that a person needs. But this, I think, if you ask me for last uh, thing that helped, which helped me is these two things. I think unlearning, uh, focusing on what you can take away, the things sometimes we take for granted aren't necessary in our lives. And I think more than um, only sort of saying, you know what, it's about progress, it's about achievement, or it's about getting to the next stage. I think just start, um, I think listening to your internal voice or internal set of values after you kind of take away what you don't need. Because then you kind of face the world from a place that you are a little bit more comfortable in it as opposed to a place where you're constantly being pulled apart. Yeah. Thank you, Sunny. Thank you. Thank you for all. And big applause for thank you. Thank you. Please, thank you.